Welcome to It's a Woman's World, where we discuss any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Here's Dr. Susan Strauss. Hi, and welcome to It's a Woman's World, and we have got a very interesting program for you today. But first, let me introduce who we will be having on our program today. We have Ali Nathani. Hi, Ali. Hello, Glad Susan. Glad you're here and uh, joining us this way. Janita Flowers. Good to see you, Susan. Good to see you. We have as our two guests today, Ellie Krug. Ellie, we're glad that you're here with us. Thrilled to be here. I'm glad you're here. And we have Jill Galding, and I'm Susan Strauss. And Jill is the founder of a nonprofit firm, I'm going to call it, you can probably correct me, called Gender Justice. Tell us just briefly what Gender Justice is. Well, sure. I should probably say I'm one of the co-founders. Co I co-founded it with uh, Lisa Stratton, okay. who's another attorney. And it is a nonprofit advocacy organization that tries to eliminate gender barriers. Okay, great. Thank you, Jill. And Ellie is a transgender woman who happens to also be an author and an attorney and a consultant and an advocate, and we are delighted to have you here, Ellie. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. And we, what we'll start with is, you know, there's just a bunch going on right now that we hear about in the media about transgender rights, transgender individuals using the bathroom, whether it's in the school or whether it's in the workplace, but what are some of the other issues that are going on regarding transgender women and men in our society today? Well, you're correct. There is a lot going on as it relates to transgender people. Sometimes we use the phrase trans as yes. well. And I think the best place to start is uh, the election of 2016, <laughs> oh. because um, until uh, Donald Trump was elected and uh, the, the country was moving in the direction of greater recognition that being transgender isn't a choice, that it actually is a real thing, that it is possible for your brain not to match your body. Um, just like for people who are gay or lesbian, it's possible for your sexual and romantic attractions not to actually match your body. Um, and before the election, uh, transgender people were having increasing rights in the country. Although, as we sit here right today, there are only, I have legal rights in only 18 states yes. and in Washington, D.C. Um, but there was great promise. In May of, uh, this, of this year, the Department of Education issued a guidance about how to, how to be welcoming to uh, transgender students in public schools. Uh, we had a number of other social things going on. I mean, uh, say what you will about Caitlyn Jenner, but she did a lot of good yes, for the transgender yes. community. But with the election, uh, I, I fear that all, much if not all of that has changed. And it's noteworthy that um, President-elect Trump is instilling people into his cabinet, his nominees are Almost every one of them have a track record of being intolerant of uh, gay and lesbian and transgender people. And out of the, what I call the LGBTQ alphabet, lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning, um, it is the transgender people who very often are the ones who are at the, at the end of, of things. And we're the ones that, that find our place um, difficult to hold. Yes. Um, and I've, and, in, and I, I think our community right now is very apprehensive, very fearful about what the future may hold, what gains that we had made, what will we lose? Um, and even worse than that, um, how many more states will enact what are called bathroom bills where yes. you know they target transgender people to say you, you must use the bathroom according to what your birth gender, Mm -hmm. is so that would mean of course that I need to use the men's restroom in North Carolina and Mississippi yes. and a number of other states which uh, sounds fairly scary to me mm -hmm. so Ellie if, as, as uh, you've been talking you know I think one of the things um, often is being mis very misunderstood and I, I wonder for someone that might be watching us right now could you just give us a little foundational knowledge about 
when you are a person that is transgender, why do some of these things matter? What, what are some of the things particularly um, that, that are important? Because perhaps some people just may not understand fundamentally, why is that such a big deal? Can you shed sure. some light on some of that? Well, sure, of course. And, and, and um, uh, let's go back 20 years to when gay and lesbian people were starting to become very much more visible. They were being asked the same question. Why is it a big deal that if you were a, a man, why was it a big deal that you have to be able to kiss another man, you know, or have a romantic relationship with another man? And somehow in 20 years, much of society, mm -hmm. you know, has adapted to the idea that it's okay for there to be same-sex attractions. With transgender people, um, we have a thing called gender identity, which is really something in our brain about how we uh, view ourselves gender-wise in relation to the world. And um, if you're transgender, your brain does not match your body. Mm -hmm. Again, we go back to gay and lesbian people. In your brain, you have this attraction, if you're a, a gay man, mm -hmm. to other men, but your body, I mean, biologically, doesn't match the way it's, you know, quote unquote, supposed to work. Mm -hmm. So for transgender people, um, it is the idea of about being able to live authentically as who we really are. Mm -hmm. And for people like me, I have phrases I use. One is gender corrector. These are people who live their lives according to their birth gender mm -hmm. for a number of decades, 20, 30, 50 years. I transitioned genders at age 52. For us, um, the idea for a very long time of being able to live as who I really was in my head, a, a woman, which just seems so, you know, beyond possibility. And so once you get to the point where you get brave enough to live as who you are, mm -hmm. you get brave enough to make a lot of very difficult choices and you make those. Mm -hmm. Jill, as an attorney dealing with these issues, could you address how many Oh, let's see, in the last two years, how many cases have come forward on, with gender justice that are dealing with transgender rights? It's actually a huge part of the work that we're doing. Um, we do education work, we do policy work, which means working, you know, people know what policy is, working on the laws to make sure they say what they need to say, but we also do litigation. So we have been bringing a lot of cases forward, and we have clients ranging from what Ellie would uh, refer to as folks who are gender correctors, so mm -hmm. adults um, who are transgender and who have run into barriers, for example, people who get fired in the workplace simply for being who they are. And uh, we also have very young clients, or their families really are, are the clients, and we're talking uh, in one instance about a five-year-old mm -hmm. who um, was just being who she is and ran into some really unfortunate bullying and uh, and just, you know, in terms of this concept of being her authentic self was not being allowed to be her authentic self in her school, and that really causes a young person a lot of harm. Um, so we've been representing um, folks in all those different situations, and we're doing that because we think that's a vital part of gender equality. Yes. And, you know, just, just to kind of go backwards a little bit, the way Ellie does to really break things down, mm -hmm. um, the problem that we're struggling with in, in this country, I think, is that we've been conflating or sort of tying together in a very st stereotypical, rigid way mm -hmm. a couple different things mm -hmm. for, for decades, mm -hmm. centuries maybe. And one is the way your body is, what people might call your sex. And I, and I want to say a few words about that because I think that's where a lot of the action could be in terms of people rethinking things. Another is gender identity, which Ellie was already referring to. Just whatever your notion is of being a man or being a woman, a boy or a girl, what do you feel that you are? And everybody has that, whether you're cisgender or not transgender or, or trans. And then the third would be a sexual attraction, romantic attraction, um, being gay or lesbian or bisexual. And the problem that we've been dealing with that gender justice is really about is we have those as three little rigid boxes that are inexorably connected. You know, if you have uh, male genitals, then you're a man, you should have a gender identity as a male, and you should love women. Just bam, yeah. you know? And that's not the way it works. I mean, scientifically, that is not the reality for people. You can take any one of those characteristics and kind of mix and match like animals, if you will, and come up with a whole diversity of people. But if we only let one sort of arrangement be okay, then a whole lot of other people um, are being, you know, they're, they're not being allowed to live authentically. Sometimes they're not being allowed to 
access education or health care or, or have jobs, I mean, every part of their lives. This country's supposed to be all about respecting diversity, right? Isn't it? But these are really deep-seated attitudes. We learn them as a child, and it's, it's hard to let go of them. And sometimes I think even the way progressives talk about this, it makes it harder to understand, you know, what how we really ought to think about it in order to let people live their real lives. And one of the things I was going to mention was this notion of sex. If you talk to actual biologists who study how our bodies come up mm -hmm. with this thing called sex, it turns out that they are uniformly understanding that sex is complicated. Yes. It's not just what you look, you know, in the baby's bottom when it's born and right. say, it's a boy or it's a girl. It's uh, it's made out of our chromosomes. It's made, I'm not a biologist, so I'm not going to be able to rattle this off as easily. Um, but once you understand that that's more complicated than we really know, like what I basically say is we need to be a little more humble about that. We need uh, to have a little bit of humility point. about what sex really is because basically we don't know how the body does that. What is going on in the brain? What, it go, what is going on genetically? This whole X, Y, Y, yes, Y thing? Yes. It's not as simple as you think. And so the best way to understand actually biologically what a person is, is to ask them. Like, like right now, biologically, the best answer we have is to ask people from the standpoint of their gender identity. And if people say, I'm a girl or I'm a boy, that's the best hint we have about what the biology is. Okay. So this notion that, you know, a biological man is in the bathroom, you don't know that. Yes, that's You right. actually don't know that's that. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, as a mom of school-age children and, you know, hearing mm -hmm. all the different things that are going on in schools, right. and I don't know a lot about the transgender community, but when I hear um, parents talking about their children knowing, like, at the age of five and mm -hmm. six, I still don't understand because kids change. Like just thinking about my kids and you know the things that they've said at one point when they were five and what they said at seven and what they said at ten and how they just continue to change. How do you explain so that a parent can start to understand a little right. bit better mm -hmm. when children are five and when they're ten and they can identify it and you can take that as as basically law for them where we know they're still changing, developing, evolving. Mm -hmm. Right, well, first of all, it's, um, it's a gender identity ex um, statement by the child over time. I mean, we don't measure it just at five and, and you know, figure out, oh, well, there, there you go. I mean, the child has to continue to express that, mommy, mommy, I'm really not a boy. My name really doesn't, I don't want Daniel anymore. I'm really a girl and I want to be known as Susie. And that's the kind of thing that the child has to advocate for themselves over time. Mm -hmm. But the parents, parents are not doing this by themselves. I mean, I, parents come to me regularly, and I make a number of recommendations. And the very first one is to find a good therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there are parent support groups uh, here in the metro and in Minnesota, but not in every state and not in every lo uh, major metropolitan city. I mean, we're very lucky here in, in Minnesota. We're very lucky here in the Twin Cities, we live in a bubble as it relates to LGBTQ people, particularly transgender people. So, Ellie, when, when did you realize that you were female? And if you don't mind telling us, what, what's your journey been like when you say that you became your authentic self at 52? And my gosh, I, to think you were living in an inauthentic way for so many years must have been Oh, I can't imagine what that would be like. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your journey? Well, I'm, so I grew up in the 60s and uh, the early 70s at a time when the word transgender hadn't been invented. Mm -hmm. and, and the concept that your brain couldn't, didn't, you know, might not match your body and that you'd be able to do something about it. I mean, just totally foreign. And I you know, grew up in Iowa. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and so I didn't fully understand it. Um, I thought, frankly, it would be something that would go away. Mm -hmm. and at it what did. age? At what age were you having this awareness? Uh, probably eight to nine to okay. 11 years old. But, but I really did think it would go away. And you know, I ended up living a, 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 the kind of life that any um, biological man would love to have. Married my high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when uh, we were together for 32 years before wow. it fell apart. Wow. Um, went to law school, she followed me to Boston. I learned how to practice law in a large uh, law firm in Boston as to be a trial lawyer. We went back to Iowa to raise a family. 
Before it was over, we ended it. We lived in a the best house, a house in the best neighborhood, um, country club membership. I, we had two beautiful daughters. Um, I had a law firm with four lawyers and ten support staff. Money in the bank, brokerage accounts, family vacations, three cars and a four car garage. I mean, <laughs> all that anybody, you know, the perfect life. Yeah, perfect, perfect life. But what was missing was me, and. Um, and I, you know, I started with therapy in my 30s. I went to a therapist and said, I don't want you to help figure me out. I just want you to help me stay married because I really love my wife. We were soulmates. And, and after a couple of years, a the therapist said, I don't know what you are, but you need to leave your wife because if you don't, you'll kill yourself. And I mean, he was very right in that sense because transgender people have a high, high you know, incidents of attempted suicides. It's 40 times what wow, the, wow. The, the attempt rate is for people who are cisgender or non-transgender. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually it came to a point I had a moment of truth um, that uh, I imagined being on my deathbed looking back at my life and I imagined um, thinking that I was a coward. Mm -hmm. Ellie, I just want to say, you know, mm -hmm. when I hear you say that, and I've heard that uh, some, from some other stories, you know, just just want to pause right there because um, that's, um, that's something we need to pay attention to. And I would also call out that for people who maybe don't understand this issue, um, that you just think about what was just said. And when you think about the children um, and what they go through and Absolutely. not being able to be their authentic selves, that um, if you hear the stories of some of the teenagers uh, and the struggle and not having that support system and not having somebody to understand them, um, that this is really real for people. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, so thank you for sharing that with thank us. You. And I just think that um, this poignant point is, is so important in our discussion today um, because I think this often gets overlooked and we must as a society stop and think about what you just said and how that impacts people. Two years ago on December 28th, a 17 year old transgender girl named Leela Alcorn who lived in Cincinnati um, wrote a, a goodbye note, put it on um, Instagram or some social media where she scheduled it and then left her home went to the nearby interstate, mm. waited for a semi-truck to come no. down the road, and stood in front of that no. truck. And the reason was that her family wouldn't accept her. Mm -hmm. And they believed that God doesn't make mistakes. And they urged, um, they required that she go to th uh, therapy. They took away her forms of social media, for it, so whatever support that she had, they took away from her. Mm -hmm. And she had no choice in her mind, other than to end her life. When, when you were um, experiencing this and you said you had married your soulmate, and Did. Is, your, is your wife, well, I don't know if she's your wife anymore, but is she, is she still a part of your life? Or is she still supportive of you? What, what transitioned during that time? So um, my, uh, my wife, Lydia, um, loved me greatly and, and, and I loved her so imagine coming to the realization that you have to love yourself more than you love someone else even your children to me that was such a foreign idea that was it was so taboo in my head for the longest time Mm -hmm. But as one, and I, I, I joke around that I've seen eight or nine or ten different therapists for 17 years. Um, somewhere along the line, one of those therapists said to me, what would your children rather have? Mm -hmm. Would they rather have a dad who is a man take his life and be gone? Or would they rather have their dad as a woman and be alive and living authentically and maybe teaching some lessons about what it means to be strong and to be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. So when the therapist put it that way, obviously you know, you know, yeah. a rational person what choice, choice they make. Is. But this is not easy, okay? And tied up into the living as a transgender person, it's not just about transgender people. 
It is about the common issues that we all have. We all struggle with the idea of being true to ourselves. We all struggle with the idea of how it is, how, how will we make our way through the world. And we all struggle with the idea of being good to ourselves, of having compassion for ourselves. And it was very hard to leave Lydia. It was so hard. But what I did not want to do was to lay on my deathbed with all that I had accomplished, all that I had accumulated, all the people that, I had, that had come to love me as a man. I did not want to lay there and take my last breath and say that I regretted my entire life. So has she been a part of your life since? She, she has gone on and remarried. Um, I just saw her three weeks ago. She lives in a, a, a southern state with her husband. Uh, we co-parent extremely well. We have two now 20-something uh, daughters. Um, and uh, I'm a bit sorry to report we're still co-parenting, but... Uh, <laughs> Who are you living with? <laughs> but, um, but no, we have, a, we have a decent relationship, but there's a loss. Oh, you know? I would guess a big loss. But I have to tell you, I'm in this journey that I've taken, and I don't want to dominate all the talk here, but in the journey that I've taken, I've, under, I've come to understand the difference between loss and regret. You know, mm -hmm. loss mm -hmm. fades over time. We're good, we, as humans, we adapt, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we can put loss in its place and be able to go forward um, with our lives. And the loss over time becomes less severe. Regret, on the other hand, is the opposite. Mm -hmm. It burns so much hotter over time mm -hmm. and if you don't deal with the thing that is causing you to have regret I just don't think there's anything good that can come out of that mm -hmm. one, one of the things that that I read um, I think I copied I think it was from your website is what what is the difference in being a woman now and being in a patriarchal sexist misogynist society compared to having been a man in that patriarchal sexist society. What, what lessons have you learned uh, from that? Susan, that's a two-hour talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, have me back, okay? Um, let me tell you, um, in short, when I lived as a man, you could have come to me 20 times a day for 20 months and said, it will be different. And I would have told you, oh, I understand. I would have told you, yes, I get it. I, I know that it'll be different. And the reality is, it is, there's just no way to really understand unless you go and you live in the other gender. And that's, so, um, yes, everything that women believe in terms of the deck being stacked against them about how men, are, men can be demeaning and men have their own little power club um, and that how women have a second-class status in our society is absolutely true. I sat last week with somebody who um, uh, was commenting on some of my writing. I'm also a columnist for Lavender Magazine, as well as I blog. And uh, the, he was looking at the piece, telling me that, first of all, it was shocking. That was a word that he used. <laughs> and then secondly, telling me that it was hysterical. No. Mm. I was hysterical for what I had written. Mm. And as I heard that, I was like, mm. you would never have said that to me mm -hmm. if I was as a, a man. man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You never would. Mm -hmm. So it is completely different. And I don't think that women have any idea of the extent to which testosterone drives and control men. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that men have any idea of the extent to which not having testosterone can orient your life, give you a sense of peace, and I don't think they can understand why it is that women are good with just sitting. Can I interject being. there, though? A little bit of a different framing? Sure. I, I, I'm only a cisgender woman, so I don't have that experience. But I think all of that could be true. And what also needs to be in the, in the picture is the societal aspect of all this. Because I think sure. what you've experienced uh, in living as a woman and being treated as a woman by society is a tremendous loss of privilege. 
and anyone who's had the opportunity, so to speak, of losing privilege has a little bit of a clue of that. And I had that in my own life in a, in a way. I used to be a law professor. And for various reasons that actually have to do with gender advocacy, I felt that I had to leave that job. I was like a, a whistleblower in a sense. And I, and I quit. And um, when I quit that job, I actually quit it not for another job. It was such a dramatic need for me to leave in terms of my own ethics that I just said, well, I'm leaving and we'll see what happens next. So I went from being a law professor, which if folks don't live in that world, that is a very privileged kind of occupation. You're very much up on a pedestal. You get a lot of um, sort of, it's, it's a subtle human thing, but it's sort of in our monkey brain, you know, when people have privilege. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the women of color sitting at the table with us. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about in terms of color privilege. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you're not sensitive to that and you haven't ever had to navigate it, like obviously the, the truism is the more privilege you have, the less you're aware of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, men just carry this privilege that they don't know they have. And if you have an opportunity, so to speak, to lose that privilege, all of a sudden you're like, oh, it feels so different. And I had a little bit of that when I stopped being a law professor and became, you know, what I was seen by others as an unemployed housewife boy, that's a different status. Mm -hmm. And I just felt sure. it all day long and how people treated me. How are your two daughters doing? They're doing good. So one of the things that gender correctors experience is they experience, they, we lose things when we go from our birth gender, the life around that, to who we truly are. And uh, we lose people. So I, for a while I lost my oldest daughter because this was too difficult for mm -hmm. her. Um, I have a younger daughter who has always been in my camp and a great advocate for me, but I am so thrilled to report that my oldest daughter came back. Mm. She came back in, with the greatest of passion in my favor, and so I am loved by both of my daughters. I have good relationships with both of them, and I am just so incredibly lucky compared to many Mm -hmm. gender correctors who lose people and they and those people never come back to them and I think well, I just want to add like saying how your your daughter oldest daughter eventually came around and I think that speaks to just the love of us primarily as humans mm -hmm. and a lot of times some of the acceptance issues or advocacy issues could be around a lack of knowledge mm -hmm. and so we want to love we want to we want to be introduced to the world and give out love but sometimes when we don't understand things we don't understand yeah. and so mm -hmm. we don't know how to extend the love beyond sort of that box mm -hmm. so I, I agree and you know and what I say my favorite saying is is that I believe that 99% of all people want to do the right thing mm -hmm. It's just that many of us are afraid. Yeah. We don't know what the right thing is. And with that, I'm going to say <laughs> we could probably sit and talk for eons about this. I want to thank both of you, Ellie and Jill, for coming and engaging in this awesome, I would say, discussion. And I hope that you all, as our, our viewers, have learned at least a, a little bit more about gender, about sex, and certainly about transgender people and I want to thank you all for joining us today and we'll see you later for It's a Woman's World. Thank you.